First up is uh, Johan Storm, uh, uh, who is a professor in neurophysiology here at the University of uh, Oslo and the leader of the Forum for Consciousness uh, Research. And uh, I will not give a very large introduction uh, <laughs> to everyone here uh, to save time and for give more time to hear what Johan has to say about the uh, mechanisms behind dreamings. Yeah. Could you please give me access so I can show my slides? Uh, it's not allowed to sh for me to share at the moment. Now it should be allowed. Okay. Try again. Uh. Okay. Um, thanks for this opportunity to talk about this. Um, hypothesis for how the brain can generate dreams on the sort of the, the neurophysiological level, a cellular mechanism for dreaming that they call apical drive. And uh, as you know, and as I've heard, uh, the brain is able to generate a whole world of experiences that appears all by itself uh, with the now no direct uh, sensory information while we are asleep. And this is very interesting, of course, because it shows uh, the ability of the brain to generate this virtual reality that we immediately experience. And we believe that it's a similar or the same, essentially the same mechanism that analyze our awake behavior. And um, I'll get back to that. Uh, sorry, our awake experience, our awake consciousness. So this is highly relevant for consciousness in general, uh, why, why and how we dream. Um, so there are, when you ask what are dreams, there are really two kinds of questions, of course, that also Eric Hulu just uh, mentioned. But uh, one is about the functional dream, why the, uh, did they evolve? And the other is about the mechanisms, the short-term mechanisms. Um, how did the brain actually generate dreams? Um, so um, uh, actually my, I just take away the, this, um, screen images as I'm covering my slides, so I can't see them. <laughs> okay, um, so, uh, so um, uh, and that, uh, I'll concentrate on these mechanisms uh, then, and we have an idea what might happen. So this is, um, what I'll say is much uh, from this paper that we published a little bit more than a year ago in December 2020 with, uh, from, with Diana Ru and Francesca Ciclari, Bill Phillips and I, and where, where we ask what drives neurons to generate the content of dreams and through which mechanisms do the neurons underlying dream experience are, are they activated during dreaming? So this is really what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so there are of course several different mechanisms that have been proposed uh, and there are mainly two classes that are the bottom up and the top down mechanisms. And the first class is represented by Alan Hobbs's uh, well-known uh, ID, the activation input modulation model, where it thinks that the, the originate um, activity in the brainstem in the form of you know, PGO waves that uh, excite visual cortices and are then processed and synthesized by higher brain areas, very much like normal sensory input would be. But the other class is the top-down mechanisms that has been discussed by uh, Ival Nir and Joe Tonon in their great um, review article in 2010, where they proposed that dreams may be closely related to imagination where the brain activity flows in the top-down manner, starting from abstract thoughts, uh, concepts and wishes, and then, then enriched with sensory percepts. This is, of course, quite uh, compatible, I think, with what uh, Eric just uh, proposed. And it's also com compatible with our the uh, hypothesis that concerns the specific cell mechanism that may underlie this um, um, top-down uh, generation of dreams. And we call this apical drive. So to tell you the, the theory or the idea in a nutshell, we believe that during dreaming, the cells are activated primarily by the top-down internal input arriving at the distal part of the dendrites in the cortical pyramidal cells that you see depicted here. With their long uh, dendrites, big tuft uh, 
uh, uh, near the Pia, and then all the cell bodies uh, down here in the deeper layers for the layer five, at least. And in contrast, uh, during awake perception, they are mainly driven, the cells are mainly driven by bottom-up sensory information from the sensory organs. And that, then they generate output in both cases that are fairly, can be fairly similar and they come from the same population of cells. And therefore, this information is treated more or less the same for about the downstream network that will then, and that may account for the um, fact that our experiences during dreaming seem quite real. There are various degrees of that. We can, can go, come back to that. But that's the main idea. You have top down. Uh, uh, activation during dreaming and bottom of activation during uh, awake perception. I should say that our lab has for decades been working down at this cellular molecular level, trying to work out all the mechanisms uh, of interest and trying to uh, see how that could be relevant for the higher level uh, phenomena uh, of the brain. And um, it's always been our hope that this would be relevant for the higher level uh, phenomena, of course. And I can think I can show some, propose some examples of that. And uh, lately, since uh, 2015, when we joined the Human Brain Project to the uh, Project on Consciousness Research, we have worked in both in top-down and bottom-up uh, directions to try to, uh, to, to bridge this gap. So what I'll show is will be an example of an attempt to bridge this uh, long gaps between the molecular and cellular level and the mental level, so to speak. Um, so, um, this, just to show an example from, from our, our lab, how we can record from all these large day five preamble cells in the, in the neocortex, brought from the soma and from this long apical dendrite uh, that you can see the main stem of here, and see how action potentials that are activated. Uh, in the soma, travel all the way up to the uh, this, this dendrites, and you can record it with patch clamp recording in both places. And we can make mathematical models of this because these cells are hugely complex. They contain uh, thousands of ion channels uh, that generate all this electric activity, and they belong to um, uh, several, um, uh, like uh, 40, 50, 60 different types in each cell. So it's far more complex than we, what you see in, normally in textbooks. And to deal with all this, to generate this, uh, this um, uh, cellular, detailed cellular models sometimes, and this shows an example of that, how when the cell is stimulated by synaptic input in this branch, the, the polarization goes to the soma, activates an action potential uh, nerve impulse that travels back into the synaptic area and, uh, and tells that that was a successful triggering of an impulse. So these are people who have worked on these models for four years. I'll just skip quickly through this. Now, um, uh, to, uh, um, um, get back to the main topic, um, I um, will now talk about these different brain states that uh, correspond to the conscious awake state and dreaming state, which are also conscious in this way, own way, and the dreamless sleep. And to start with the awake state, when we get sensory information for, for, through the eyes, for instance, uh, we can. For, uh, the, this sets up this um, uh, Im image of a of the outside world in, in our brain, and this corresponds, to, as I said, to sensory input, input coming to the som somatic area through basal dendrites and so on. But this sensory input is encoded in the form of nerve impulses that can mean a lot of different things. So just this input by itself is insufficient, uh, probably, to tell the network and the cells what this is really meaning. So just to, uh, to interpret this input, the cells have to compare this with um, other uh, information from that is stored in our memory, this context information from other sensory organs or from the uh, outside the, the, um, the this um, part of the visual field, and also is, is uh, affected by emotions to tell us how important is this input. And all this information is then compared to the uh, uh, incoming sensory input at any one time. And when there's a good match between this uh, input from, say, um, um, uh, long-term memory, uh, uh, semantic memory and, uh, and uh, episodic memory, then we will um, 
uh, recognize what they see. And that, uh, that happens through an amplification process that's called April amplification that seems to occur in distal dendrites. And this little explosion that causes an activation of the cell that activates downstream networks and the, the whole activity will cause us to experience uh, this sensory input. That's the wake state. During dreaming, as I said, then there's an other kind of application process that is su sufficient to amplify the, the internal information alone. So that is uh, can, by itself can cause some, ex cause of, some experience, for instance, this Pegasus uh, um, that I can then uh, be composed of input from our memory stores. And finally, the, a third uh, state of the cell is in the what we call apical isolation, when uh, the there is evidence that this distal dendrites can be disconnected um, from the uh, other parts of the cell, and then even internal input will not activate the cell, and that may happen during dreamless sleep and certain forms of anesthesia when they don't have any dreaming. So that's the outline of the idea. But let's go, go a bit more uh, detail through this. Um, when you are looking at the cup uh, like this, of course there will be photons hitting the retina, setting up nerve impulses in the, in the optic nerve, going through the thalamus and to the um, to the uh, to, to the cortex, uh, where uh, there will be uh, set up um, action potentials. Um, uh, um, that uh, sort of uh, codes for this uh, uh, percept. And if you look at these pyramidal neurons, they have a complex machinery, as I said, by ion channels and receptors uh, all over the dendrites. I will be able to only talk about a few details of that that are particularly relevant. Um, so when uh, we had both feed forward uh, uh, input and contacts and feedback information that uh, is um, uh, fits with the feed forward uh, input, then we had this uh, explosive activity that causes a burst of high frequency action potential to be generated in, in, the, in the axon in the segment and travel to, to, the, to the other cells in the network. Um, and this context uh, cons uh, consists of lateral connections from other parts of, of the visual uh, field and other sensory areas, feedback from higher cortical area areas, various forms of memory, higher order thalamus and amygdala uh, signaling in, in the emotional state of, of the other animals or other or, or individual. And what's really happening here that's this, is, is that this feed forward input and combined with the contextual feedback input together is able to uh, depolarize the distal part of the apical dendrite sufficiently to activate a bunch of different voltage gated calcium channels out there to generate a dendritic calcium spike or plateau. And uh, this causes uh, uh, then, um, uh, um, uh, uh, this is conducted to the soma and the axon and the um, axon initial segment where the spikes are generated and then signaling downstream that something has been recognized and then they can experience it. There's evidence from animal experiments that only when this recognition or uh, epical amplification process occurs can the animal actually experience experience it and will report that they have seen uh, or, or, or felt something. And the, some of the evidence from that comes from this um, classical paper from Matthew Larkin and worked with Bert Sackman in, and published in uh, 1999, where he in an isolated uh, lay fiber pyramidal cell could measure and simulate at different levels in the, in the dendrites and soma. And he found that when he put in input only to the distal dendrites, so we can put there, have no effect in, in the, on the action potentials. If you put in a small stimulus in the soma, that also causes only a small response to the dendrites and soma. But if he combined the two, it was this massive nonlinear amplification process that causes a burst of high frequency spikes to be generated in the soma to go down the axon. So this is really the, apparently the crucial. So this burst is really uh, the signal that something has really been uh, um, experienced. And why uh, does this happen in particular during REM sleep? Well, I will, there's probably evidence soon that during REM sleep there's a very high 
level of acetylcholine in the brain. And that there's evidence that that can, through metabotropic uh, muscarinic receptor, activate another a specific, specific class of calcium channels that can e more easily generate this um, plateau uh, of the polarization that can be conducted to the soma and generate high frequency bursts or spikes, even without any proximal sensory input during sleep. And this evidence from that comes from, uh, from uh, Australia, from the Flesch and Willems paper 2019 in, Euro in Neuron, where they activated the cholinergic fibers of the genetics and then saw that they could then easily trigger the large plateau potential in the dendrites that's translated to high frequency firing in the soma and axon. Uh, but uh, I should tell you that. Uh, this hypothesis of ours it goes uh, against two fairly influential ideas in current biochemistry. Most textbooks will tell you that as a colon is high both in the wake state and in REM sleep. I'll show you some examples of that. This is from a neurochemistry textbook where you see uh, that the um, uh, uh, as the colon is uh, uh, depicted to be equally high in both wakefulness and REM sleep. And it, of course, it's very important in wakefulness to keep us awake. If we block this uh, activity, then we fall asleep immediately. So just during non-REM sleep, the, the level is really low. But, uh, and also here in the um, paper by Nir and Tonani, they said that the cholinergic uh, modulation is highly active both in, in the wake and, and the REM sleep. Uh, and uh, as shown by these green arrows. But it's, they, one gets the impression that it's equally high. Uh, but it turns out, when I was searching to the literature while writing this review paper with, with, uh, with, with the others, I found this uh, particular, um, uh, um, it's re sorry, it's really annoying this, uh, all these pictures covering most of the slides here, sorry. I had to move it out of the screen. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, this is from Lee et al, uh, 2005. Um, uh, Alonso was also on the paper. They didn't they used a different method where they actually measured the, the firing rate or this particular cholinergic neurons in the basal forebrain that supplied the cortex with acetylcholine. And then they found evidence that the REM in the during REM sleep, the, it's far higher activity almost 10 times higher sometimes than during quiet wakefulness. This changes the picture quite a lot. So this may explain why, um, uh, for, uh, and, and this shows that, gives evidence that the acetylcholine is far higher in REM sleep than in wake. And that may explain why we don't hallucinate and dream when you are awake. Although the, um, uh, because the acetylcholine level then is not high enough to make this apical drive very active. Another factor that is a bit unconventional is that um, we think uh, we know that noradrenaline is very low during uh, during um, REM sleep compared to wakefulness. But there's been a dispute in the literature, or actually the dominating view has been that noradrenaline closes a certain kind of iron chance that are highly relevant here. I'll show you why. Whereas we think the opposite is the case that they actually open this chance, and that's uh, important for this dreaming. Uh, mechanism. So these are the so-called HTN cation channels, uh, HTN, uh, that conduct both sodium and potassium, they open by hyperpolarization, are open at rest, and uh, they will tend to sabotage this the apical application because, because the current can leak out. However, uh, when during REM sleep, noradrenaline is really low, then uh, if we assume, as you have evidence for, that these noradrenaline actually open these channels, then the low noradrenaline will cause them to be closed, and then this uh, uh, calcium plateau can be faithfully conducted to the soma and cause a high frequency firing there. Uh, in contrast, uh, during wakefulness, high noradrenaline will cause these channels to open, and that will make the current leak out so that um, um, uh, the plateau is attenuated and you have only low, low frequency firing. So if you have eyes closed, no visual input, then you don't hallucinate and start dreaming when you are awake because uh, then your uh, the plateau doesn't work 
uh, as well. So during REM sleep again, we have the perfect combination of very high application of the distal input. Uh, so the, that they drive um, the cell from internal sources and at the same time that it can be faithfully conducted because these uh, leaking uh, ch HDN channels are closed. Um, and I just show you some evidence. This uh, stems from a paper that they made, uh, wrote about almost 30 years ago with my first PhD student, Parla Pedersani, the one in, in, in uh, Neuron, one in PNS, 1993, 95, where we worked out the various um, um, mechanisms of these various transmitters. And what we found was that all the monoamine transmitters went through a pathway that released as the call line, uh, no, sorry, PsychMP inside the cell that this pathway branched. So one went through protein kinase and closed certain potassium channels, whereas others open uh, these HTN channels by direct binding to the channel molecule. And that is exactly the same as found in the heart. That's why your heart beats faster when you have adrenaline in, in, in your blood uh, when you are excited. So um, this mechanism is uh, well documented all the cell types which we also found in the, for the first time in the brain in this PNS paper. And that is now relevant. Uh, this is by the way, a figure from the paper where we measure with voltage clamp the current through these channels as you see here and see how it increases when you add a beta receptor agonist isoprenaline. And then if you add PsychMP also the current increases uh, uh, as expected. And you see the time course here. And now recently, uh, Nick uh, Hagerborn in my as a PhD uh, uh, student in my lab now has studied this in layer five neocortical pyramidal cells and also there finds uh, uh, that these HCN channels are actually opened and it causes more current when you have noradrenaline or beta agonists uh, in, in, in uh, uh, acting on the, on the, on the cell. And you see that how this can then uh, sabotage the conduction of distal input to the cell by activating fibers in layer one to these cells and it's a synaptic input here and see how this is reduced when you open these channels um, by a supranally beta agonist. So this all seems to fit together and uh, I don't have time to uh, tell you why we think the others went wrong. I thought this was the opposite. I mean, that's also big labs in the States who have claimed that uh, for years. And we have now, I think, understand why they went wrong. But uh, that will be in our paper as we are writing it now. Anyway, to, to uh, sum up um, very briefly, there are these uh, states of the cortical pyramidal cells and, and the circuits, and in particular the dendrites, apical amplification during awake sensing, Epical drive uh, during sleep, uh, REM sleep uh, dreaming, and uh, epical oscillation during dreamless sleep and, and, and anesthesia. And interestingly, this epical drive may be even more important when we are awake during imagination and imagery and fantasy, when, that which all rely on internal input. So that remains to be investigated, but uh, we think this is a, a perfect mechanism for also generating uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, activity that could be sort of instead of the of the of the fiction input that the um, Eric Holder has talked about to, 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 to supplement our dreaming at night. So this is an interesting possibility that we'd like to discuss further. And I should just mention that these mechanisms I just talked about is closely related to the analytic integration theory that were published uh, in parallel with our paper in, in the transient cognitive neurosciences. And um, it also led to our the, uh, work of anesthesia that also Suzuki and Larkin had looked at before and we worked out the paper about the four. But I have to tell you that all this is highly simplified, of course, it's far much more complex, but uh, I, I hope that I've given you a sort of an outline of the, uh, of the idea. And I also have to tell you that there are problems with this hypothesis uh, for instance, uh, uh, that there are also frequent dreams in non-REM sleep, and that's the call on is, is, uh, is much lower. And we have ideas why that could also occur through other metabotropic receptor types, but I don't have time to explain that. So this is our group, the brain signaling group in the uh, University of Oslo, where they see, you see uh, Andre right there. 
a different ha hairstyle. <laughs> you see uh, uh, Nick uh, here on the picture at least, and then the, 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 the patch clamps and this is Ricardo Murphy, the computer model at the moment. That's all. Thank you, Johan. Uh, now everyone has a deep understanding of the uh, cellular mechanisms behind, or I suggested cellular mechanism behind the dream. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and now we will uh, move a little bit uh, up in the um, in the level of, or down in the level of complexity. We will, or go higher up in the um, level of abstraction. Uh, so next up is uh, Eric Hull, who is um, research assistant professor at Tufts University in Massachusetts uh, in the US. And um, <clears throat> to tell us something, a brief summary of uh, his previous talk today about the overfitted brain hypothesis. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. So I think that when sort of theory crafting, when it comes to thinking about why it is that we dream, what is the evolved function of dreams? Why would an organism spend so much of its time um, in this sort of very particular neuromodulatory milieu, which, which Johan just, just talked about? Um, obviously, there's still some, some interesting things to be discovered about what that, that milieu is, but why exactly would we uh, spend so, so kind of so much time in it in such a particular state? And, um, and, and why would we consistently experience uh, something, uh, why would we spend so much time in a state where we consistently experience things that are very strange or weird or odd, right? The very term dreamlike often means something you've seen in the movies of David Lynch, um, or you've read Borges or Kafka, uh, or Talio Calvino, right? I mean, like all these things are, um, all these things are very strange to think about what would be the evolved or selected purpose of. But in deep learning, it's actually very common to feed these uh, large artificial neural networks, things that are governing uh, self-driving cars or whatever is sorting your spam or promotional tab filters in Gmail uh, or, or so on. Whatever they, these artificial neural networks are doing, it's very common to take the data set that they're being trained on and warp it or corrupt it in some particular way. And they do this because uh, in general, um, learning is not just memorization. Learning is, is memorization, but also generalization from that memorization. And if you memorize too well, or you train too well, uh, you'll get stuck. You'll become what's called overfitted. Um, and you can use overfitted in sort of highly technical ways, or you can kind of use it in, in a broad sense to just mean overspecialized. Um, but it seems as if the mammalian brain would certainly face this problem. I don't see a good reason why it wouldn't face this problem. And this problem, this problem seems ubiquitous and very difficult to get out of, especially for um, you know, mammals or organisms where you can't turn the learning off. You're always learning. Um, and so it seems like you're always sampling your environment. And in general, the samplings of your environment are not going to be a good statistical sample. They're going to be a biased sample. You're going to be undersampling your environment. The, your day-to-day -day, um, uh, data will essentially have all sorts of quirks and weird correlations and all these other things that you actually shouldn't be paying attention to, but because you can't turn the learning off, you will end up paying attention to it, right? And one thing that might combat this would be that if nature had evolved an intrinsic way of dealing with overfitting and overspecialization and overlearning, and if they did that, it might look very similar to taking something that kind of looks like waking activity, but corrupting it, making it very strange, making it, you know, dreamlike, and uh, applying that and that this might actually help the organism seemingly paradoxically, right? Because it's learning such strange things, but really what's going on is that it's being forced out of this very particular uh, state. It's being forced to sample and learn from this really weird non-day-to-day -day distribution. And so this explains the paradoxical strangeness of dreams, and it also explains why, um, why they would be selected for, even though, of course, if you don't really have access to this sort of, uh, this sort of metaphor involving artificial neural networks, but also learning in general, because I, I think there's good evidence that this is just a general feature of learning, uh, then you don't really have access to why, why they would be at all beneficial. So that's what I think um, 
uh, that's what I think the, the, the kind of evolved function of dreams are and that they're evolved to combat this, this natural uh, and constant overfitting that, that mammals face. Um, and I think that, um, you know, w one thing that the uh, kind of dream field should, 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 should focus in on is trying to dissociate exactly the, the types or dimensions of learning um, and things like differentiating between generalization and memorization. And also, um, you know, I, I'd like to test it with something involving dream substitution. So something like, well, if, if this is the case that we're getting some benefit of dreams, that's basically an experience of the dreams themselves, maybe we can get that benefit when we're awake. And you could say combat sleep deprivation a little bit by exposing uh, like, uh, you know, weary pilots to uh, very dreamlike VR short experiences or something like that. Um, if you want to learn more about the overfitted brain hypothesis, you can just type in the overfitted brain hypothesis into Google. Um, and there should be a paper up there and a couple articles as well that contain more like high level summaries. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Eric. Um, so uh, we will continue rapidly on to the to the next uh, panelist. Uh, so that is uh, Carolyn Horton. Um, she is a reader in psychology and a director of Dreams Lab at the Bishop Grosteste University UK. I'm not sure if I pronounce uh, the university name. Uh, correctly. You did a very good job. We, <laughs> we, we're called all sorts. Yeah, it's Bishop yeah. Test University. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, we are interested to hear what uh, Carolyn has to say about um, the more cognitive scientific approach to, to dreaming. Um, so take it away whenever you're ready. Um, now we're thank seeing... you very much. Yeah, perfect, perfect. I'm hoping you can see my slides okay and, and not my various notes as well. Uh, but yeah. thank you ever so much for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, and thank you in particular to uh, Johan and Eric for um, providing an introduction and, and Eric in particular for uh, giving an introduction to some of the, the cognitive science models that I will try to elaborate on. So I guess I hadn't intended this because I didn't know what you were going to say, Eric, but I hope what I might be able to do is um, provide some hypothetical mechanisms, perhaps, for some of the theories that, that you've been talking about. And I'd be interested to see if, if you agree or not. Um, OK, so one of the questions that we've been asked uh, to, to try to discuss and debate is what are dreams? Now, here's a really basic starting point with a definition and a very unacademic definition that is often used and understood in, in kind of lay terms about what dreams are. And that is that it's just a series of images, ideas, emotions and sensations that occur involuntarily in the mind during certain stages of sleep. Now, I take umbrage with a number of aspects of that. Um, the first bit is that necessarily that dreaming is a, a sort of serial manifestation of a number of different states. We know when we sample dreams systematically across the night, across different stages of sleep, that sometimes dream experiences are really quite fragmentary. Sometimes they might just be a, a sensation of, of movement or proprioception or a, a single emotion or just a colour, for example. And sometimes, as, as we more commonly think of dreams as being, they might be a bit more of a crazy, bizarre narrative that might involve a number of these different elements. But they're not always in a neat sequence. Um, whether they occur involuntarily, well, you know, some people could, could debate that idea. For the most part, we don't seem to have control over our dream content. We are somewhat passive in um, the experience of them, even if uh, some of us have a tendency to be in a sort of observer in dreams. And some people are much more commonly uh, heavily involved and, and central and really feeling it and experiencing their sense of self within that action. Most of the time we accept it as if it's really happening. That is, our reality monitoring ability is um, is uh, very poor during sleep. We, we don't realise that this isn't real. We don't realise it's a dream unless we experience lucidity, which is a, a distinct state in and of itself. So I take umbrage with the fact that, that dreaming may occur during certain stages of sleep. The kind of definition that we tend to employ in our lab work is that a dream is anything that you can recall after being awoken. Um, and we know that if we ask people, what were you dreaming? then we get a very different kind of quality of response to if we ask people what was going through your mind before you were awoken. And if we ask them what was going through your mind, we're able to elicit 
Um, sometimes these more fragmentary uh, images or just these emotional sensations that I described before. So as a cognitive scientist, um, I will be more interested in the phenomenal quality and experience of dreams than perhaps the cellular uh, basis of them, um, as, as Johan will. Um, hopefully what we can do is correlate our, our, uh, our data to see the extent to which they overlap. Um, for me, a fundamental aspect of dream definition is the understanding of memory and memory process, because we have to recall our experience and we have to drag it over into our conscious awareness in order to make sense of it. So for me, understanding memory is a fundamental aspect of understanding dreaming, and not least because uh, one of the theories that Eric mentioned earlier is um, a, a theory of the function of sleep, and that is memory consolidation. And this is the idea that as we go to sleep, uh, a number of different aspects of memories, because memory is not a unitary phenomenon, uh, a number of different aspects of memories are selectively um, reactivated to some extent across different cycles of, of sleep and different phases of sleep, giving rise to very different brain activity in different regions. So we've got this really sort of complex and multifaceted model that will in turn um, selectively enhance our recallability of particular kinds of memories. So that sounds really complex um, and it is, and it, this is the Russian born model of the brain that you can see there. So during certain phases of sleep, there are um, brain patterns, electrical activities, neuron firing, where the, the cells are almost singing together. And we don't get that experience during wakefulness or at any other time in our sort of conscious existence or our lives. It's really quite fascinating. So slow wave sleep is where we have these brain cells singing together and that uh, harmony of neural activity correlates very closely and predicts the recallability of particular kinds of experiences namely the kinds of experiences for our own waking lives the kind of recent episodes that have happened to us and then in different stages of sleep like rapid eye movement sleep we are better at recalling um, emotional experiences we see a lot of brain activity enforcing um, the uh, the regulation of emotions and also um, different kinds of memories, memories for things that we can't really articulate, things like if we're learning a new language or learning to drive the car, then rapid eye movement sleep helps with that. So that's the sleep based stuff, right? So if we have to think about why we are dreaming, we have to take, in my view, a, a starting point of an understanding of memory and sleep and how they relate in the first place before we can even add in the concept of dreaming. So the work of my lab is then to take this memory consolidation starting point and see how it fits on to the experience of dreaming. And that's very difficult um, methodologically, um, but it's not impossible. What we found in our endeavours, and I'm, I'm rushing ahead already just to try and give a flavour, is the following core characteristics of dreams. Okay, so we know that dreams, when we sample them, are composed of memories of our own experiences. Not in a very clear-cut way and we don't dream of our experiences in the same way that we experience things in our waking lives so let's say you have a dream tonight about this seminar now you are very unlikely to have a dream where you may be sat in front of your computer screen and you are seeing a powerpoint and what you are dreaming of is exactly the kind of content that uh, uh, one of the panelists or the presenters was presenting as you remembered it it's probably going to be that you are in that PowerPoint slide, or you are talking to somebody in real life with one of the panelists, it's going to be mixed up. So we know that when we dream, we take elements of our experiences from um, uh, our recent past, or sometimes from our very old past, and we mix it up a little bit. We also know that dreaming occurs across the night, so it's not just a rapid eye movement sleep phenomenon. We've been able to um, have a very comparable recall rate um, when we've woken people up, um, from uh, stages uh, N2, N3 as, um, as rapid eye movement sleep. So dreaming, if, if we ask the right questions, if we ask people, tell us what was going through your mind, we get about 71, 72% response rate. Um, uh, nevertheless, REM dreams are still a little bit different. They tend to be longer. They tend to be a bit more emotional and a bit more bizarre. Dreams generally are more emotional and bizarre than waking memories. Um, however, there's a bit of a recall bias there. We tend to recall our emotional experiences from our waking lives, so it's not really a surprise that we do so in any other aspects of our lives as well. Nevertheless, when we can control for that statistically, dreams are still a little bit more emotional, a um, little bit more negative as well, a little bit more bizarre and weird than our everyday lives. 
I've already mentioned this fragmentary element of uh, memory sources in dreams, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail. And it's led us to um, propose this idea that uh, dreaming cognition is what we call hyper associative. That means that instead of having one memory activated whilst we are asleep at any one time, we're activating a number of different memories and we're mixing them up and we're putting them together to create something new. So uh, we know that the longer that we are asleep for, we have more of these hyper associative experiences. We have fewer earlier in the night. We tend to dream of things not exactly in the way that they experienced, were experienced in our waking life, but they're more realistic and less weird. And they're a bit more weird the longer that we are asleep for. So we see this increase in hyper associativity as a function of time spent asleep. So let me try to explain that hyper associativity a little bit more. Now, one thing that we want to do when we're trying to define dreams is try to um, distinguish between dreaming and other aspects of our cognition. So um, Johan talked about dreamless sleep, for example. Um, whether that means non-REM sleep or not, perhaps not, as you've indicated, but we need to know what the boundaries of dreaming are. And one way that we can do that is by comparing dreaming to our waking cognition, um, which again is very multifaceted, just like dreaming is. But it does allow us to work out the extent to which dreaming is similar to waking function and, and the extent to which it differs. And really, you'd be quite surprised, perhaps, but dreaming can be really quite similar to waking function in that we still have some pretty impressive cognitive ability and metacognitive ability. We can still think about our thoughts. We can still ruminate about our actions. We might dwell on our emotions and say, why do I feel guilty at that particular point in a dream, just in the same way as we would do when we're awake? So we need to be careful not to think that dreaming cognition is somehow deficient compared to waking cognition. It's often not. Nevertheless, one way that we study dreaming is by breaking down a dream into discrete categories of memory sources. So let's take the idea that um, we have a dream. This is a very generic dream that we're dreaming of ourselves as we are now at this time in our lives. We look the same, we're kind of the same age. Um, but what we are doing is in a childhood location. So it's really common that we dream of things happening in our uh, school, for example, when we're a kind of teenage age. And that's a really common thing that we find in, in our dream studies. But what we're doing is talking to somebody who we've never actually met, but they were from a film that we watched the previous time. OK, so we've got these different elements from experiences that are all somewhat familiar. They're somewhat all continuous with our waking lives, but they've been mixed up. And what we have started doing is breaking these down into looking at the, the, the who's, the current self and the, the familiar people. The what, what are we doing? The conversing here, the talking, what kind of cognitive activities are we capable of? And um, the whens, the, the age of these different memory sources, the wheres. And then we start grouping these together to see if there are any predictable patterns. And there are. So it's quite common for us to be ourselves as we are now in our dreams, just as we would be in our own kind of waking memories at this time in our lives. But for the context, for the setting to be from some time ago. So we've got a decoupling of different elements of these memory sources in a predictable fashion. And yet each of these, these, these groups of memory sources all come from our own experiences, whether they are real or somewhat imagined or experienced in a book or in our imagination or in some other way, they still come from our autobiographical memory, our memory bank for our own experiences. Again, even if they're not truly experienced, uh, externally validated memories. So one thing that we think is happening here, one thing, one, one, reason perhaps for this fragmentation of the memory sources is that there is a decoupling of the the what's um, and the where's from the when's so there's a bit of a decontextualization thing going on so it seems like we're activating elements of memories from our own lives we're ripping them apart and we're separating out the when's and the where's from the what's and perhaps the whys and, and the feelings too. So we've got all of these different bits, but it seems like if something is important to us, we may experience emotional arousal. We may experience some kind of um, tagging of that experience to indicate that it's important and perhaps needs to be thought about again um, and perhaps needs to be reprocessed. Maybe that's just through sheer repetition, as Eric has talked about, you know, if you keep repeating the same kinds of uh, experiences again and again, then that's kind of 
a repetitive message to our mind brain that maybe we need to be taking note of this or, or maybe we actually need to stop doing things so automatically we need to just take note and appraise somehow and some of that appraisal can happen offline when we are asleep when we've stopped allowing stimulation from our normal external environment to reach our mind brains through the eyes and through other means we've stopped all of that and that, that gives the brain mind the time and the space to uh, to process what it's already stored so what it's doing then is it's, it's got this indication that some experiences are more important than others but if they're really important and we need to kind of have them accessible and memorable for later we need to make sure that we remember them not just in the same space and time and location that we have experienced them before but that we decouple them and that let's say we stepped out in front of a car does it matter that we've stepped out in front of a red car on one particular road or does it just matter that maybe we need to be a little bit cautious in, in when we're stepping out on all roads maybe the latter in which case we need to decontextualize the important bits separate it fragment it and make it more accessible at a later date so one thing that we've been sort of theorizing is that this fragmentation this hyper associativity this splitting up and then rebuilding up of these memory sources is crucial to allow the important features of a memory not all aspects of a memory but just the important bits it's important to allow those bits to be noted that they're salient and then to be integrated in, into our long-term memory structures and that's that's memory consolidation and that is something that we think sleep is very important for we don't really know if dreaming is important for it and, and i do have to say in, in thinking about whether there is a function of dreaming i think we have to to at least entertain the idea that there might be no function of dreaming, that dreaming is just a byproduct of these other uh, sleep related um, manifestations of memory activation. That we forget most of our dreams. Um, maybe that's useful. Maybe that's very functional. Maybe if our head, when we woke up, was absolutely full of these crazy, bizarre simulations and these mixing up of memories that we've experienced. We would wake up extremely confused and uh, there are certain theorists that would argue that the nature of the dream state is very much akin to um, psychosis um, and, and we have to bear that in mind so maybe it's functional not to think of dreaming as having a, a use necessarily but maybe it's just a byproduct of having parts of the brain up. so this is the big part of our theory okay this is the idea that dreaming is perhaps part of uh, memory consolidation but it, it's sort of a correlate we don't know if it's a cause it's a correlate of memory consolidation processes and we've studied that by uh, by looking at the fragmentation of memory processes but there's one big but and that is if we look at um what people are dreaming there's quite a lot of commonality and there's quite a lot of overlap so this is a bit of a problem for a cognitive science viewpoint because in uh according to our model the sources of dreams form in, uh, are formed entirely from our own autobiographical memory banks, our own experiences. And although they're deeply personal, we can have some sort of understanding of memory function and memory consolidation during sleep that, that allows us to build these models, these laws around uh, how sleeping cognition may operate. Yet these commonalities across people show that there's, there's maybe something greater than merely our own autobiographical memory banks that is at work here. So this is Calvin Yu's work. This is not my own work at all. This is Calvin Yu's um, list and, and just some examples here of the top 100 most common dream themes. And there are some real commonalities. So the most common dream uh, theme is being chased or pursued, but not physically injured. Quite a lot of the, the top 10 and top uh, top 50 really are quite emotional and they're quite fear laden actually if you look at them being physically attacked um being locked up falling being killed um, sexual experiences ferocious beasts killing so they are based around quite negative emotions and so i think we have to acknowledge that there is some emotional drive that is perhaps Binding these experiences together, even though our own experiences are very unique, the emotionality of these experiences seems to be bringing them all back to some kind of similar path. So even though we have been able to demonstrate that we can fragment dreams and recognise the predictable patterns that allow dreams to be built up from our memory banks, there also seems to be a real uh, important role for 
emotional processing, emotional regulation, um, and perhaps emotional memory consolidation. I've tried to whiz through. I hope I've been uh, somewhat um, clear in, in the process, and I hope I might have provided a segue to some of uh, Brigitte's work on emotion processing as well. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for your talk, uh, Carolyn. Uh, it's uh, great to see some uh, slight alternative uh, views presented. And I'm sure that uh, our next uh, speaker will uh, uh, present, uh, go even further um, away from the more neuroscientific uh, and more into the clinical and therapeutical, uh, which is a very interesting aspect of dreams. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Birgit, Hols uh, Birgit Holsinger. Uh, she is a um, lecturer at the Vienna University of Austria and a co-founder of the Austrian Sleep Research Association. Uh, so I see you have... Um, I've been able to share your screen. Yes. Uh, um, let me first of all uh, say uh, um, how honored I feel and how uh, excited I am to be invited to this conference and to this panel here. And uh, indeed, probably what I have prepared is a bit different than from what we've heard before, even though to me there is uh, quite some potential for overlap. And uh, I try to be as short as I can because we have uh, moved into time already. Um, we are just to, as a remark, we are working here at the Medical University in Vienna and also at the Institute for uh, Consciousness and Dream Research. And I am personally um, sort of, so to say, at home or started out my career, career as a Gestalt therapist and a Gestalt psychologist. I know those are very old German terms, but uh, they still uh, have um, quite an influence on how I see my work and, of course, also dreams and dream research. And just as a reminder, uh, let me uh, briefly explain what the Gestalt is supposed to mean. Uh, it is... Uh, an entity based on our perception through so our senses that um, we form in order to be efficient uh, to um, create our, our views of the world, so to say. And uh, Gestalt is a, a, big that, uh, a, a term that goes back to uh, Christian von Ehrenfels. And if I show you a few pictures, you will uh, immediately um, know what uh, Gestalt psychology means, or there is a, uh, tries to point at it. It is about perception and it is about uh, a sensory um, input that then uh, creates through our um, feelings um, uh, Gestalten. And with these Gestalten, we are also then looking at the world, and uh, I'm sure that there are several pictures here that are very familiar to you, uh, that we have background and foreground is an important term in Gestalt. The perspective is a, an important uh, uh, term in Gestalt. And uh, uh, how we see things in a specific context is um, dependent on that context. Uh, and the perspective, of course, and we have heard, I think, about um, perception already, uh, is um, uh, a concept in Gestalt therapy and in Gestalt psychology. Now, why do I talk about this? Uh, it is um, <clears throat> because we were asked about um, uh, how do we uh, see dreams? Why do we dream? And our take here in Vienna is given that uh, fact or that, that notion that we probably mostly dream during REM sleep, uh, maybe uh, in other sleep stages, uh, and that we also have uh, are able to incorporate so-called internal but also exter external stimuli in the dream content. <clears throat> given the physiology uh, of uh, REM sleep and uh, I hope, uh, of course, that is uh, a bit of a problem here because the physiology of non-REM sleep is very different. Uh, but let's say um, at the 
most intense or vivid dreams probably are related to REM sleep. Uh, and, re and REM sleep we know as um, uh, a state of uh, emotions, um, memory as we have heard, and I would like uh, maybe also to add integration. And uh, in, a in a nutshell, sometimes I like to say or claim that uh, or ask the questions, could dreams be emotions in moving pictures? I would take it uh, uh, even a little bit further and ask, um, uh, could dreams be what we call tableaus? Uh, it's a, a, a technique from the, from the arts where you, have, where you play scenes of a movie, for instance. And the movie also only consists of scenes, actually. Uh, but um, Caroline just talked about the fragmentation of dreams. Uh, you could also see this as uh, scenes uh, in a row, so to say, if you like. And then the dream content, of course, um, uh, probably um, as far as we know, and I think when we look at psychotherapeutic schools and methods as well, um, one could agree kind of that uh, they residues uh, in uh, appearing in our dreams, uh, probably uh, fueled by uh, strong emotions, maybe anxiety the most if you uh, if one thinks about anxiety and its shades. And uh, we have been talking about memories and uh, sometimes also, expectations, we can talk about this later, why language may be repressed memories or traumatic events in case of nightmares. So that also uh, taking uh, together leads me to another daring sentence or um, hypothesis, which is, could the dreaming process be a sort of a built in uh, psychotherapy uh, that is happening uh, at night, um, just by itself, so to say. Um, another big area that I have been working on uh, are, of course, nightmares and how to treat nightmares. And I think nightmares uh, can be very valuable also in uh, giving us uh, hints and clues about uh, the dreaming process itself. And of course, uh, the nightmare is, as you know, <clears throat> a dream from which we wake up with, because we are experiencing very strong emotion, mostly fear, and we have also the uh, physiological um, uh, correlate that is waking us up. Probably that could be a claim uh, because of that strong emotion. Prevalence of nightmares, um, if uh, uh, in different situations and differ from particularly uh, from on, depends on how you um, assess the nightmares. And uh, of course, just as a side remark, uh, nightmare, the nightmare frequency has increased um, considerably and significantly now through the pandemic. Um, so what do we do with all this? Uh, uh, notions in a nutshell. Um, I just try to mention a few things that we apply. Of course, as a Gestalt therapist, uh, the, the therapy that I um, offer uh, is uh, based on a Gestalt therapeutic concept. But overall, uh, one uh, could say um, uh, the title of our work could be that. Uh, a dream is like a piece of art and uh, the interpretation is obsolete, but uh, acknowledging that a dream wants to have an effect. And um, maybe a very different take on what uh, Eric Höhler talked about earlier, but that would mean that it is enough to dream and a dream per se is um, doing what it's supposed to do without um, uh, using it in uh, taking it further into um, self-growth or the psychotherapy or the 
other uh, aspects. But if one wants to um, acknowledge dreams more, if one is interested in one's dreams more, if one has a reason to uh, wanting to remember dreams more, of course, a dream journal is always very helpful. And um, never mind if somebody comes with the complaint of um, bad dreams or nightmares or just the wish to get closer to their dream world, um, I recommend to keep a dream journal because it seems that this uh, process of um, um, bringing these dream pictures, uh, making that effort to put them in words and then expressing them by either writing them down or talking about them, uh, already also have uh, some kind of uh, psychotherape psychotherapeutic effect and there are several uh, um, projects that have uh, shown that. And um, we also assume that memory needs has to be connected to our essential uh, experiences and um, that's what that's why we offer or that we have developed some um, a way of then re-experiencing in the waking state the dream as much as possible and in, in, in as much detail as possible and um, by re-experiencing the dreams and sure, through the senses um, uh, memories may or the associations may, may come up and uh, we uh, encourage people to um, develop their own way of um, intuitively, so to say, understanding their own dreams uh, by um, this way of sense memory. That's why we call it the dream sense memory. And of course, when it comes to nightmare treatment, we also use of the image rehearsal therapy, which then also uses of course, the dream the air sort of re-imagining, but it's not just imagining, it's also uh, in, uh, to go back into the um, quality of the emotional aspect of the dream or the sensual aspect of the dream. Um, in the waking state, create a happier ending yeah, in, in a nutshell. Um, implies that the in a picture, so to say, dream pictures, but also pictures or the imaginations in the uh, waking state uh, are a continuum. And that as uh, also an assumption in, in dream research that we um, work by. Uh, also, when uh, we come to my uh, main aspect of research, which is lucid dreaming, uh, we uh, uh, Know, learn more about the dreaming state and the consciousness state in the dream state and uh, I have a tool and we have been able to show this and develop this further uh, for nightmare treatment also for PTSD patients and from that side uh, is uh, I think we find very valuable uh, clues on uh, how to understand dreams better as well. Just to uh, remind you, a lucid dream state is a, is a dream state in which the dreamer is aware of the, being in a dream. <clears throat> we call this pre-lucid and then can also influence uh, the plot or make decisions. And I think that the decision-making aspect is uh, here of importance. And in psychotherapy, um, a lucid dreaming uh, can be very helpful for people who suffer from nightmare or nightmare disorder because they already are empowered by uh, just that possibility that they can wake themselves up or rescue themselves when uh, uh, the situation that they're afraid of is happening again. Of course, I mean, therapy is also very uh, uh, helpful and has been uh, shown by uh, Barry Karakov and others to be a, a very effective treatment for nightmares for several patients groups. And um, the lucid dreaming, as opposed to the, uh, if it's compared to the image rehearsal therapy, has the uh, advantage that, that of course, uh, the dreamer can help themselves when 
the nightmare happens. The disadvantage for some people lucid dreaming is a bit difficult to learn, but uh, we assume that uh, uh, we, uh, uh, everybody's able to learn how to have lucid dreams or conscious experiences in their dreams, or I should say um, secondary processes uh, it's like secondary consciousness processes, experiences in the dreams, uh, which it also refers, of course, to what others have said before, that we are internal in, in, in our own realm of experience and apparently somehow, at least psychologically, that seems is, is being perceived as nurturing and revealing. And... Um, that's why um, working with dreams and lucid dreams is um, uh, very valuable in psychotherapy. And I think it should be applied much more than it is uh, at this stage. Uh, with the lucid dreaming, we uh, uh, have uh, um, uh, come up with a uh, an, an, an idea more or less of where we could have cortical um, correlations based on um, the German researcher Paul Tole, who uh, described uh, uh, lucid dreaming uh, as klar träumen with seven characteristics. And these seven characteristics I have uh, tried to. Um, bringing context with brain areas. Of course, this is a very um, a generalized uh, idea and uh, the model to talk about more than anything. But it has been published in Frontiers if somebody's interested. So, and uh, just, you know, uh, so we were also speaking about dreams and uh, uh, TV likeness or the, or the uh, fiction likeness and one, uh, um, could uh, claim uh, that uh, mankind uh, had such a need for the, those pictures that uh, we call dreams, uh, that uh, we had to invent uh, things like uh, the, the movie theater and, uh, and the TV, uh, going back to some earlier claims. And speaking of which, if this was a dream, nine and a half, I think it is, uh, you could uh, decide to do something else than just uh, having to fall down. Uh, you could uh, decide to fly away and turn the nightmare into a very pr uh, pleasurable experience. And why we have dreams, why we have lucid dreams. Uh, lucid dreams are often very um, perceived as very um, um, pleasurable, but with... Uh, Happiness, and I think happiness is something that uh, is good to get more of, actually. So if you are interested to look uh, us up, I uh, uh, recommend our website, www.tom.se.at, and uh, of course our uh, 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 papers and publications. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brigitte. That was a, a very interesting uh, walk through the more uh, gestalt therapeutical aspect of dreaming. And uh, <clears throat> this brings us uh, kind of close to actually our first question in our list as well. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's also an interesting question to hear from, uh, from Eric, because uh, how does the orbited brain hypothesis relate to lucid dreaming? It seems like to be a very specific kind of dreaming. And where we, I mean, we have control of our actions and in some cases we can even control the whole dream. So how would this kind of fit in with the orbited brain hypothesis or is it a specific kind that is outside of the uh, scope. Yeah, it's a great question, and and also thank you so much for to, to all the panelists. This was very interesting. Um, you know, I think that the we we have to remember that we have no evidence for lucid dreaming in any species but humans, right? And even in humans, the vast majority of dreams are not lucid dreams. Um, it's often something you have to tra train yourself in to get good at. 
Um, I don't think I wouldn't go so far as to say that lucid dreaming is 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 bad for you. I mean, certainly maybe there are even some therapeutic reasons to to try to learn how to lucid dream or something like that. But my guess would be is that there's a reason why lucid dreams are are a, a tiny minority of dreams. Um, dreams that people are are lucid dreaming in are you know they're generally sort of more. Um, they're almost like less weird, right? Because you're 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 in control, right? So you're naturally going to do slightly less weird things than would normally happen in a dream. But uh, you know, my my guess would be that it's it's kind of like a very interesting and very human particular subset of of dreams in particular. But there's probably you know like very possibly many things in dreams, like your teeth falling out, right? It being a more common dream than not. Like we we heard some talk about how dreams are distributed or some individuals might dream a little bit differently than other people. I think that whatever the final sort of hypothesis is about why we dream, it has to be sort of broad enough to encompass the fact that dreams kind of differ and even encompass things that like things like lucid dreams are, are possible, although not really very natural. Um, and so I, I would kind of put it in that camp of like, there's going to be some variability. There's going to be some sort of weird things that happen, you know, in, involving dreams, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't like build a, a theory based off of, you know, the fact that, you know, very, very rare people with some, with a good amount of training can, can do this lucid dreaming thing. I feel like it'd be a great tool to, for studying dreams, right? To have some control of it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't mention that at all, but you're absolutely correct, John. I have a uh, question for uh, Eric. Can I ask that or? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, you were saying at some point that um, it's a problem that we are always learning. We can't turn on and off the learning that in the bad TV show we learn as well as a math uh, lecture or something. But uh, I think uh, you would agree that's uh, quite a bit of modulation of the degree of learning, right? Uh, uh, depending on the kind of interest and arousal, the emotional uh, context and so on. So it's not quite true, is it, that the, you, it's always on to the same degree at least, or what would you agree? Or? Yeah, certainly that uh, arousal plays plays a part, but, um, you know, I mean, I mean, most people remember uh, their favorite TV show far better than they remember calculus. Despite the amount of studying and repetition that you put into calculus, you can probably do your favorite TV show line by line in some instances, right? So. Um, so, so I think, yeah, there's, there, there's modulation um, uh, at, at various points, certainly when things are, are, are quite intense, but they're probably, it, it probably does not map very at, or at all onto what we normally think of as periods of learning, right? We think of periods of learning as periods of study or periods of, uh, of almost like academic interest or activity. And, uh, but, but learning is something that is just, it's just this synaptic sculpting that's sort of omnipresent. And that I think is probably occurring during dreams too, although you, you're not, you don't have the sort of recall um, that you would have with, uh, with Wake. Yeah, I agree with that, but that makes a lot of sense from an evolutionary point of view, right? Because your favorite TV show, your favorite TV show, because it's it's playing upon these old uh, instincts and dry and uh, drives, etc., that uh, appeals to your emotions, and that has more um, hundreds of thousands of years longer history than, than, than the math class. So I think uh, it's still compatible with the idea that um, the degree of learning is very modulated, strongly modulated, uh, depending on the kind of arousal and appeal it has. And a good TV show has a lot of appeal more than math to most people, I think. Yeah, I agree. I think the danger is in neuroscientists taking naive, uh, like, like naive language, right? Where we don't talk about, no one thinks of, of, of every second of every day as a period of learning, but it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and, and so, you know, neuroscientists will go and look for like the neurological basis of learning or look for like, you know, the very specific memory storages if memories are something that are presented only during, you know, yeah. tests or something like that, when really we should think of the whole brain as just a constantly plastic yeah. and, and evolving sort of neural sculpture. Yeah, but if, if I'm bored by something, I don't remember anything of it, right? So that's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not engaging. So anyway, uh, that was one question. I, 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 I want to say, actually, I actually am not sure that that's, like, if, 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 if I ask you to remember even, like, what you had for breakfast or something like that, right, in, in general, these things are not remarkable. But unless several days have passed, 
you know, most people are actually capable of quite interesting levels of recall uh, of, 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 of sort of like what's happened recently, especially sort of more short-term memory, like especially during the day. If you're probed, you can really remember a lot of your day if probed. And that's really weird because there's like this huge, you know, buffer that's, that's sort of stored somewhere. I think it's actually one of the weirdest things about humans and the, and the, and the, and the biggest hint that there is something specific that humans are doing that like artificial neural networks aren't doing is this sort of like uh, working memory sort of buffer that we have. Yeah. But the really but I take your point, Johan. Yeah, yeah. The, the, we're, we're not equally learning 100% of the time, but, but I do think in general, we pretty much spend all day learning in a particular sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, related to a question of uh, uh, boring uh, and the specific question of boring dreams. I mean, we, I'm sure we all had very boring dreams, uh, like uh, going to the office and going home. That was your dream. And uh, I, I would like to hear a little bit from uh, both Carolyn and maybe Eric, uh, like how, uh, because you had a long list of the typical dream contents in your presentation. Uh, I don't remember if I saw uh, the kind of boring dreams in that, but how would that fit into this recontextualization and integration aspect that you talked about? And then secondly, boring dream seems to be kind of not fitting with the randomness of the overfitted brain hypothesis or the generation of weird data sets. It seems to be very mundane and fits very well with our ordinary lives. So it should be kind of like a amplification of our daily routines in a way. I love the thought of boring dreams because I know that there will be some dream researchers who would say that's an oxymoron and there's no such thing because all dreams are marvelous. But um, I mean, the truth is, if we sample dreams systematically, then we can access really boring dreams. <laughs> and by that, we mean the mundane, don't we? That, you know, we, these are where we are dreaming of activities where they might be quite repetitive. It might be something that we've been doing in the day. If we've spent 80 percent of our, well, of the last two years sat in front of a screen, um, if dreaming was entirely representative, then 80 percent of our dreams would probably feature sitting in front of a screen. And that doesn't seem to happen, nevertheless if we ask the right questions, and again, it's all about this kind of accurate and systematic accessing of dreams uh, to help us understand the true nature of dreams, then, then we do see that we have boring dreams. They certainly exist. So if we are doing repetitive tasks, um, as we said earlier, and I know Eric, you mentioned this too, the more repetitive something is, even if we might not have a conscious memory of it, the repetitive nature seems to indicate or tag salience and a need for further processing and they do seem to appear in our dreams. So what, what's the function of the boring dreams? Um, if we're doing something quite a lot, perhaps it's important that we, we rehearse that particular um, action, whatever it may be. There are certain things that we know we don't dream of or that we're not very good at um, and they tend to be cognitively demanding tasks. So uh, reading, writing, mental arithmetic, um, actually sometimes computer tasks you know we, we don't dream very much of being in front of a computer we're more likely to dream of a frustration that our phone isn't working or that we're trying to make a call and you know our, our sausage fingers aren't allowing us to press the right keys or, or something so they these activities tend to be associated with um an emotional um experience usually that of frustration and there are certainly some dream theories that would say we're trying to rehearse something here. If we try with our sausage fingers to get the right keys on the buttons to make that call in a dream, perhaps when we wake up, we'll be more accurate at pressing those buttons so, so that we're, we're able to make that call if we need to. That's virtually impossible to translate to an experimental situation to test, <laughs> to get you know reliable empirical data on that. But there's lots of ideas around it. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right, Caroline. Um, and, and and just to say about these that and, and, and something that you 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 you're kind of pointing at too is is uh, you know when when we use the term mundane, right? We're using it within the context of other dreams. So it's like yes, this dream I was not on a fire breathing dragon, you know, uh, riding away, right? But um, even, even in the case where it's, it's things like, oh, I'm going to work or something like that, uh, what you'll often find is that there's still, there's still, there's still very dreamlike aspects. So for example, there's a lot of, ca there's still category breaking. So you might say, well, it was a mundane dream, but, and I was talking to my boss, 
And then later I went into the same room and my boss was my mom, right? And then I was talking to my mom. And someone might be like, that's a, it's a mundane dream, right? Like there's, there's not, not much happened in this dream, right? But, but wait a minute, but, but like from the objective perspective of your waking conscious experience, if that happened and people were like morphing into one another or spaces were changing or like you were instantaneously traveling, right? Or like any of these other things that we would be like, ah, oh, it's not much to mention in a dream, it would be considered extremely non-mundane. Um, and then I, I would also, so, so clearly you can still have category shifting um, and category breaking when, when things are, fair, are, are fairly mundane. And then also you still, have, you still have the sparseness of dreams, right? So you still have the fact that, that dreams are uh, not sort of as rich in detail, exactly as, exactly as Caroline was saying, which is like there's basically a, a, a glitch in the matrix, right? When you try to like look at your phone or something like that on, in a dream, because your, your brain... Literally, it's probably your brain can't veridically represent the waking world. It, it, it literally it doesn't have the compute to, to really represent the waking world uh, because it's too fine grained, right? So it represents stuff at like this coarse grained level of abstraction. So then when you try to look at do something fine grained, like do arithmetic or read text in a book, what you'll find is that like you can't open the book. Your brain is basically just constantly generating glitches in the matrix to prevent you <laughs> to prevent you from uh, from, from having to see this fact. Um, and so I think that you know it's not a if, if, if the vast majority of dreams were mundane, then I think it would be a big problem for the overfitted brain hypothesis, for sure. But if, if there's basically just some mundane dreams that are kind of thrown in there, and then there's some dispute, disputation around what exactly counts as mundane, then I think, you know, it's, it's not so much of a problem. Thank you. So uh, the next question is from the Q&A. So it's, it's more of a comment uh, rather than a question, uh, but maybe you have some uh, light to shine on it uh, uh, in the panel. Uh, so, if we continuously build a model of the world around us in our minds, uh, in our waking state, maybe the dream phenomena is just a correction input to our world model. At least my experience is that my worldview is not built from minuscules, but rather from a larger imprinted sensory experience. If we get this side notion of an available larger conscious space, we will expand our imagination from the baseline of our sensory reality. So I don't know if there's any comments to this uh, <laughs> comment uh, in the Q&A. Uh, if you can also get it up yourself, if um, it was uh, hard to follow my speech. Uh, it sounds very fitting to uh, what Eric has been saying. Uh, so maybe uh, uh, others in the panel have any further uh, notions. I think um, what's been described. Sorry, Pretty, you go ahead. Well, yeah, uh, that, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, just a brief comment that, that would uh, this perception and uh, through the senses and to create uh, uh, the, the worldview, so to say, would be very much fitting the Gestalt view, actually, the Gestalt theoretical view, not so much the Gestalt therapy, because there's, uh, those are two different. Um, groups, I would say, actually, the therapists and the theorists. But sorry, sorry, Carolina. No, no, not at all. I, I think you said what I much more clearly what I was going to try and say, which is really when we experience the dream, we do experience a, a kind of conscious wholeness. Um, so it, although, you know, some of the techniques that we use in our research involves breaking down memory fragments into really small component parts, we know that that doesn't really reflect the true experience of a dream, um, just as it doesn't really respect, reflect the true experience of consciousness when we're awake. Um, so I think it's an important phenomenological aspect, but one that's somewhat difficult to translate to our, our research methodologies sometimes. Uh, Johan, you had your hand up for a second. Yeah, but I think you said, I also f felt that that comment was very much in line with what Eric uh, said. Uh, 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 I have some other questions, but I can wait. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> any, uh, do you have any uh, uh, comments, uh, Eric, or did it capture? Uh... Yeah, 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 I mean, I I think we can think about the, the brain is building like a, a world model. And, and, then, and then I think that that take, you know, is, is relatively in line with the OBH, but um, I... I would, I would also say that it doesn't require, like some of these predictive processing approaches to, to dreaming are, are very specific in what they mean by like model or generative model or, or, or world model. And I think that we don't, it's, it's, it, 
it, it, it could be the case that for theory of dreaming, you really need a well worked out theory of like how the cortex functions at a high level. And you need to basically make some choice, like maybe the whole brain is doing free energy minimization. Maybe the, maybe, maybe it's a global workspace. Maybe there's something else going on, but I, I, I'm a bit wary of saying anything other than, you know, um, you, you can have different modules and, and different performances and, and uh, using more like almost behavioral terms rather than, you know, po postulating that there is this world model. I mean, I think there has to be a world model in some sense. Uh, the question is just, is that sort of like the main task of the cortex or is that sort of an outgrowth of like you have language plus perception or, or what have you? But yeah, I think it's a, it's a nice comment. Johan? Yeah, I just would like to ask Eric what he thinks about uh, Ante Revolzu's idea about that the dreams are kind of, kind of rehearsal for for uh, dangerous situations or that come up quite often. Uh, you seem not to think there was such good evidence for this, uh, that dreams are preparation for real world problems, but he has collected quite a lot of data to suggest that uh, quite often the content of dreams when studied systematically are in line with that kind of function. What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, I think there's a, there's a huge problem in mapping um, um, dream content onto, onto real life, right? So, so, at, 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 and, and this applies to his, so, so I won't, I won't pick on his, like, like studies in particular, but I'll, so I'll just describe like a general scenario, right? Which is that like, let's say I want to see if, if dreams represent the day's memories. And then you probe, and then you ask people and you say, okay, did you travel recently? And they're like, yes. And then they're like, okay. And then did you dream about traveling? And they're like, yes. And you're like, okay, well, that's, th there we go. It's like, well, but, but what I dreamed about was I was on a plane and actually I just traveled by, you know, railroad. So, um, you know, the, the question is, should we count this as similar or dissimilar? Um, and so there's a lot of sort of this sort of, you know, funkiness around the interpretation of mapping dream, dream things onto, onto real things. But, but I'll just say, just maybe to, to be strident, there is no implementable strategy that anyone has basically ever done in any dream that you would want to implement in the real world. Like <laughs> almost nothing would ever work except in the rarest of cases. Um, and that the scenarios that you encounter in the dream world are almost never directly transferable into the real world. And, and even, even, even worse, I would say there is almost no way that following dream advice would not significantly impact uh, negatively impact an organism's fitness value. Like the, the, they, they would be, you know, jumping off cliffs and, and doing all sorts of, of, of uh, crazy things. And then I would also say, I just don't think you have almost any agency in a dream. Dreams are extremely, in very, in an interesting way, like as Caroline has, as, as Caroline lays out in, in, in her, in her big list of, of, of kind of various probes of what people are thinking about, the, the, the interesting thing is that there's interesting scenarios that are going on, but the person is not like uh, responding to them as like a fully capable adult uh, cognitive agent. They're, they're, it's, it's like a series of experiences. So it just seems very uh, doubtful to me that uh, we're actually simulating anything that we want to implement or, or act or any strategies. Mm. But, but I wonder, isn't that also a problem for your uh, hypothesis that the, the, the um what the dream about is so far from real life and uh, wouldn't then wouldn't you then risk that the system learns the wrong things because it's so much uh, corrupted the, 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 too much corrupted um, the kind of uh, the data it's learning from yeah so, so it's, a, it's a good question which is like um you know is is there a way is is there a way in which let's say you were you were trying to avoid overfitting could, could your attempts at overfitting end up really you know, significantly harming the network, right? I think that that's a really legitimate question. But, you know, as far as I know, um, you know, most of the times it's, it's actually kind of a bit difficult to do that. And um, you would have to sort of swap out your data entirely. Um, mm -hmm. And then particularly, it seems as if more, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a, it seems like we have a nice set point, right? You do it for, you do it for, you know, a couple hours, um, and you're probably your, your learning rate is slightly turned down uh, at night, uh, which is why there's this amnesic effect. Um, so, you, you know, you're, you're not learning as well anyways. Uh, so it seems, it seems doubtful to me that um, there's really any significant um, worry that you're going to start going around and implementing dream strategies. It's more like, um, it's, it's, it's more like a, a nudge in the right synaptic direction, so similar to how that's done in, in deep learning. Hmm. One more question. Is there evidence and evidence that people who consume a lot of fiction 
dreamless because they don't need it. <laughs> uh, I'm very interested in that question. Yeah. Um, I've not found a great way to to go about it. I mean, I I think that um, you could do it at a population level, which might be interesting. But I think you could also do it via dream substitutions by giving people a lot of uh, a lot of like fictions, like right right before bed. But believe me, this stuff is so difficult. I mean, as, I'm sure as 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 some of the people here who actually study dreaming empirically know, right? Like, let's say I want to do that. Well, okay, I give people VR late at night versus people who don't get any VR. Okay, well, what's VR? VR is bright, right? It's really bright. So are, are, are you're, you're gonna have an effect where you're just blasting people with blue light late at night versus you know, your control group who, who you know, isn't blasted with blue light. So this, this stuff is, uh, this is why I gave up being a, a, too much of an empiricist like early on in science, because I would just get very frustrated and then never do anything. Hmm. Carolyn, you had a, your hand up. Thanks. I think I've had it up and down lots of times uh, in a dancing style because there've been lots of interesting things said. But um, there's lots of evidence around individual differences uh, of dream recall. Um, so individuals who are more likely to enjoy reading kind of fiction and uh, a kind of a, a wide range of genre of film are more likely to remember their dreams. So whether that reflects something. Um, underlying about their, their general creativity levels or whether it's something else, we don't know. It's really hard for those kind of methodological reasons that Eric has just outlined to work out whether that's down to a, a kind of sensation or a learning environment or whether it's something more about their um, their personality and their character. But we, we would think probably a bit of both, but there certainly seems to be some individual differences that are, are really reliable um, around being more creative, more fantasy prone, um, more likely to suppress your thoughts, you're more likely, funnily enough, to, to, um, to have high dream recall. So there's there's loads of really interesting individual differences, notions on, on dream recall. And um, men are far less likely to recall their dreams than women. No one really knows why. Doesn't map on to cognitive function or memory ability or visual memory ability. Um, but it's all all very fascinating. And by the way, we, we've used VR extensively as, as a kind of manipulation technique. We've programmed our own learning environments and tried to see how much we can influence dream content. Um, not very well, you know, apart from the fact that people most often dream of the lab and the learning environment. So that, that's the, the biggest thing that we can induce. Um, if you try to get people to dream about very specific things, they, they don't want to comply. There's too much error and too much interest in the whole um, dream content world. So we're struggling with that, but we're busy trying. Thanks. Uh, here's a very interesting question. And uh, uh, maybe it's a question most for uh, Begit and Carolyn. Uh, so how, uh, how does disease that affect perception of reality and memory affect dreams? Would you like to go there, Bridget, or would you like me to have a bath? Sorry, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the first uh, sentence. How does, uh, how does diseases, uh, like, for example, <laughs> schizophrenia, that affect yeah. the perception of reality and memory, affect our dreams? Yeah. Um, well, with, for instance, uh, schizophrenia, you have a different type of sleep if you're not under medication. And it's very difficult to answer this because, of course, um, uh, people with psychiatric, psych psychiatric diseases are usually under heavy medication. And that already makes changes, uh, the, the, the dream recall at least, also the REM sleep sometimes, of course, the amount of REM sleep. Uh, but if you go to... Uh, some, um, uh, the, the groups of, of psychiatric disorders that are not that uh, heavily um, um, impaired, uh, not that expressed, but like uh, what we have done was uh, research on uh, dreams and dream content of uh, people with uh, eating disorders. And it seems like that you find uh, themes and topics that may fit to the to the disease uh, in the dreams as well. And uh, there was a very interesting difference between our groups. Uh, namely, we had the bulimics and we had the um, 
anorectics, and the anorectics described dreams in one to three words. The wall was white. That was the dream description of a typical dream description of an anorectic person. Whereas uh, bulimic people uh, epically described their dreams. They often drew pictures and uh, paintings and explained everything in detail. And what was interesting in that study as well was that the uh, bulimics would say, oh, they are very interesting dreams. And if you had a, uh, a, a, an independent rater rating the dreams with the emotional content, they would <clears throat> rate those dreams as extreme nightmares. So that was interesting, given the theory about um, <clears throat> eating disorders, uh, being a little uh, detached from, from the feelings, for instance. Yeah? And uh, that is, um, of course, a very um, interesting question. And um, I was just thinking myself about um, people suffering from autism, uh, thinking about Eric's theory. Uh, whether they would, they would probably remember less, I guess. Uh, but from what I remember, I think that uh, uh, people with autism do dream and do, do re recall their dreams as well, for instance. So, and with depression, it's very difficult because with, with, as with sleep in depression, you have people who expressed the, the depression with a too much sleep and others don't sleep enough and uh, some uh, recall uh, some types of depression have uh, 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 much more dream recall and others uh, um, hardly sleep and hardly dream therefore also uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, area and needs to be looked into more closely yeah, there's a I'm really sorry, interesting. But... Um, sorry, Budi, do you want to go? Was, that, was there a theory, or there was there a, um, uh, uh, and, and something in the, in that question that the, I hope I did? I, I mean, I hope I answered a little bit. Sorry, sorry. Thank Karen. you. I was going to say there's um, a really interesting relationship between the time spent asleep and your experience of psychosis. And it's, it's a kind of U-shaped relationship. So if you don't sleep very much at all, I mean, if you are experiencing severe sleep deprivation, um, then you start to hallucinate and you start to experience these kind of uh, delusional experiences that are highly like a psychotic episode. Um, so it, it seems like you need to sleep a little bit in order to experience that kind of psychotic episode in a safe space. Because if you don't, if you don't have the opportunity to do that during sleep, it, fragment, it, it permeates into your wakefulness. But then also, if you sleep too much, um, you know, more than nine, 10 hours a night, and or if you are diagnosed with some kind of um, uh, sort of psychosis or psychotic episode, then you really struggle to distinguish between these sleepy kind of schizophrenic episodes or, or psychotic episodes and these wakeful ones. So it seems like when you're sleeping a lot or when you're experiencing these psychotic episodes a lot, then that differentiation between sleep and wake and psychosis is really blurred. Um, so there's lots of theories around um, psychosis being like dreaming experiences. And, and lots of people say that actually when we go to sleep at night, we um, don't know what we're doing. We think we're flying. Um, we have all of these crazy episodes and we, we, we believe they're really happening to us and then we forget all about them. <laughs> and that is exactly, exactly what psychosis is. So this relationship is, is um, really close and really complex. If I may maybe add to uh, Caroline and to this question, uh, the dreams of people suffering from PTSD, obviously those are nightmares, but they go into, of course, what we call a flashback as well. So that um, you, the people who have been suffering from trauma, they re-experience the trauma in the dream. So that would be probably raise questions with, with uh, Eric theory maybe, but maybe Eric, you can say something to that. That would be very interesting. Yeah, like as as far as I'm aware, in terms of in terms of the research, you know, um, 
in, in a lot of these studies that have looked at correlating, you know, real world events to, um, to, 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 to dreaming content, the only cases where, um, um, where, where people kind of repeatedly dream either the same dream or dream about a previous event are generally cases of diagnosed PTSD. So it's a very unusual current. I mean, even, I, you know, even in studies where they'll do things like they'll look at dream reports after Hurricane Katrina, which is obviously a very traumatic event, but actually the, even the, the occurrence of like hurricanes in people's dreams doesn't actually change that much. I mean, I, I think I was reading one study where they looked at 850 people after 9-11 and not one reported for months, like dreaming about anything related to 9-11. So I, I do think that it's, it's you know, we, we have to admit that certainly dreams are gonna have some variability. Like there's a, there's a, a question uh, from, from Hedda Hassel-Merck, uh, who, who I know uh, in, in the audience as well in the Q&A. And, you know, she's asking this question about where some people have a lot more nightmares than others, right? And I think that this sort of vari variability uh, needs to, it doesn't need to always be completely explained away by your theory, right? So I, I think if a theory could explain exactly why one individual has more nightmares than, than another individual, right? Uh, that would be insanely powerful and probably a sign that the theory might be overfitting. Like my, my suspicion is that there's just some natural variability all the way down to some pathological cases. Um, but, but in general, people do dream more about fantastical non-real events, maybe not so fantastical, uh, but, but relatively fantastical compared to day to day. Uh, Johan, you had your hand up. Your microphone is off. Sorry. Uh, Eric was talking about the sparseness of dreams. I saw so, so, so a few details. I'm sure it's uh, something uh, true in that. But on the other hand, I suspect that the, some of it could be due to memory, um, that you don't remember the details. I mean, uh, certainly uh, I've heard about an experience myself, I think, extremely detailed, vivid uh, sensory experiences in dreams when I, but I quite often they are sort of very uh, trans, I mean, they, they are elusive, they are lost within seconds uh, or, or minutes. So, um, and it, no, that's not a question, why do you forget dreams so easily? I have my own ideas about that, but you have it within your theory, uh, um, idea about that. Yeah, so, so I think it, it, one has to be careful about what one means by phenomenological sparseness. So what does it mean to have sparseness in your phenomenology? So it doesn't mean to not experience intense things. So hmm. like if you're, if you're in a dream and, 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 and like an artillery shell goes off, goes off next to you because you're having some dream about, I don't know, World War I or something, right? Uh, that might be immensely intense. But what I mean by sparseness is that the, 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 literal, the literal richness, the, the literal level of detail that you'll be experiencing will be at probably a higher level of abstraction. So like if, if that had actually happened to you, there'd be all sorts of like micro details within the, both, the, both the, the visual scene and the auditory scene that you would be exposed to. And I would claim that those, are, those would be basically universally lacking in dreams. I, I, I really think that people don't have the hyper level of fine-grained phenomenological detail, but that doesn't mean they can't say, experience something that's very beautiful or intense or moving or emotional or all these other things and it's just a bit of a it's just a bit of our la our language is never really precise about so this sort of thing. I think, I think and, right. and so that's what i think that that really is yeah. mm -hmm. it's a great question yeah. mm -hmm. so um we only have uh, time for uh, uh one more question before we are at our allotted time but uh, if the panel is interested and uh, the attendees are interested in uh uh, going a little bit over time because I think there's many interesting questions still to be answered, but uh, uh, it's perfectly understandable if people have to go now at the appointed uh, time uh, to those who wish to leave, uh, it, be it panelists or uh, audience. Uh, I wish you a good night and sweet dreams and thank you for attending. Uh, of course, I had to put in that little pun. Um, but uh, I suggest that uh, if the audio, uh, panelists are willing, that we maybe tackle a few more questions. Does that sound okay to everyone? Yeah. Yes, that, that's lovely. I do actually, unfortunately, have to run because I got to go. Uh, I got to go take this girl behind me out for a walk uh, before it gets dark because it's getting darker. But uh, but I really appreciate. Uh, let's stick around. But I really appreciate 
uh, everyone's uh, comments and questions and hearing other people's talks um, and, uh, and this opportunity. So thank you so, so much. Much, much appreciated. And thank you so much for joining us, Eric. It's uh, oh, great been a pleasure. You. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Great. Time. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. All the Bye. best, Eric. Too. Bye -bye. Uh, so we have a question actually for Johan here from uh, from the audience. Um, so is um, if the sensory input uh, uh, parenthesis visual is important, does this mean that for blind people this part does not act, but blind people also dream, right? Yes, but uh, I just use uh, visual input as an example, you know, of course our dreams are quite often visual for normal people, but uh, of course there's a lot of other uh, auditory and other input and uh, emotional content and so on. That uh, So uh, it's not entirely dependent upon visual input, uh, but uh, I believe that people who are born blind, they have less visual content than people have been seeing. Mm. Uh, yeah. Maybe Add to that, yeah, we, we a long time ago we did the re, uh, some research about the dreams of the blind people, and the ones that were born blind experienced dreams and recall dreams, but in the sensual modes that they knew. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if people uh, became blind, say after uh, twenty one, they would still dream visually for the next five years, and then uh, the visuals seem to be thinning out. Yeah. Yeah. But is this also the case for those who are have are blind due to damage to the occipital cortex, or is it uh, uh, does this uh, only go for those who are blind due to damage to the to the eye or to the occipital nerve? That was a research project twenty years ago, but that's a great research question. I, I, I think there's evidence that people have uh, lesions limited to V1, the primary visual cortex. They can still have visual dream, but I. Uh, perhaps with a more abstract level, but um, yeah. So, um, so the I think the it's sufficient to have the sort a little bit higher level vision areas uh, present for having visual dreams. And while we're on this topic, uh, and this is uh, quite interesting uh, as well, uh, uh, why do uh, why do dreams usually uh, are, are limited to visual and maybe auditory experiences? Why are why is smell, for example, uh, and taste often uh, not present for for many people? I don't know exactly how many people uh, do only dream in one or two dimensions of uh, sensory perception, uh, but it seems, at least from what I know, it's uh, people are usually dreaming in visual stimuli. Some do also dream in auditory. Uh, some dream in black and white. Some dream in color. And some might also include taste and others. Uh, are there any thoughts about why this is the case? Yeah, but I mean, my understanding is that the, the general um, theory put forward to explain this phenomenon, and phenomenon being that we tend to dream in a roughly proportionate way to the way that we experience our waking world, which are predominantly auditory and visual, therefore our dreams are, is something called the continuity hypothesis. And it's a really vague, no, it's not a vague theory, it's a broad and, and far-reaching theory which just says that we tend to dream in the same way that we experience the waking world. And that, that doesn't sound um, really that surprising, but actually uh, it's not very many years ago that people thought that dreaming was such a fundamentally different state of consciousness to waking that that would be quite radical that we would dream in the same way that we that we experience our waking world and um, so we don't actually use a sense of, of olfaction of smell very well as humans and um, if dogs could dream perhaps they would have a, a greater um degree of a sense of smell in their dreams because that's how they experience their waking worlds but we just don't know we can't ask them we have absolutely no idea if they dream or if they just experience you know, REM sleep or something else um so th these are just senses that we're really quite familiar with we do experience sense of taste um and there's quite a lot of evidence for that um just like perhaps we experience a lot of dreams relatively uh, around um grinding teeth losing teeth People do grind their teeth when they're asleep. It could well be that our dream experience is just reflecting or, or making sense of a, an actual physical sensation at the time during sleep. Um, and that can translate into a sense of taste. So taste is, is has been documented to appear in dreams. 
um, a sense of smell, less so, sense of touch, even less still, but vision and, and auditory sensations really quite common. Yeah, and what is uh, forgotten, I think, often is that uh, when we talk about our senses, also a kinesthetic uh, perception uh, should be taken in account, and we don't have that often when we talk about sen sensory perception in dreams, because I think move, there is much more movement than we are aware of in dreams. So that would yeah, be... True. And, and same with proprioception, recognising our sense of physical space, um, it and place when we are asleep that's all a bit confused we have these sort of flying dreams perhaps again our brain is sort of uh, over simulating or overcompensating for the fact that we are often quite literally paralyzed with the exception of our, our eyes hence rapid eye movements and our respiratory system and um, so it could be that there's some overcompensation and, and that's why we have this kind of vestibular uh, system activity um, that's giving rise to really quite emotional <laughs> um, dream experiences. Thank you. Uh, our, we have a very specific question. It's not necessarily related to, uh, to, to dreaming, but uh, I know this is uh, very up uh, Johan's uh, field of expertise, so I will include it so uh, <laughs> uh, we can have a specific answer here. Besides neural networks, have you investigated the contribution of non-neural cells, such as astrocytes and microglia, around the neurons? They do not have action potentials, but can affect the action potential activity of neurons, for example, through the release of chemokines and cytokines. I'm not aware of that that has been investigated. We have uh, studied neurons all the time, and we still believe that's the most likely no, uh, play our most um, reasonable place to start. I know there are lo lots of modulatory effects on to other cell types, but I don't think that they are that uh, crucial. I'm, of course, you know, I think like uh, leukokines and uh, the chemicals during um, diseases can cause you to sleep more and that sort of thing. But, but you know, that's a separate issue. Yeah. Um, so I don't know much more, much more about that. Sorry. Yeah. So, so in relation to dreaming and uh, or sleep experiences of so any kinds, you don't know any of uh, studies that have investigated these non-neural cells? Not particularly. I know people are very keen on the idea that astrocytes uh, networks can be important for consciousness. consciousness so there are so many of these astrocytes, etc. But uh, to me, it seems more likely that they are more housekeeping uh, uh, cells than... Uh, the really um, fun, uh, most important signaling I think is going on in neurons. But maybe we will see something with the glia at some point. Yeah, yeah, astrocytes are glia and, 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 and they have calcium waves, a sort of signaling, and they have sometimes uh, the release of signaling uh, substances like uh, many other cells also have. But I mean, the massive, uh, dense uh, information processing that you see in the neurons, I, is, I think, is not. It's not like that in, in those glial cells, as, as far as you know so far. Uh, thank you. So uh, I have one question that uh, sadly Eric is not uh, with us anymore, uh, or he had, had to go walk his dog. But uh, uh, we have talked a lot about uh, dreams and why, why we have them in a way. But uh, we haven't talked so much about if we can use dreams for anything. So Birgit has ta uh, talked a little bit about it. But are, can we use dreams for anything? Can we utilize them somehow? Uh, can they be a window into our kind of subconscious, uh, as some like to say? Or can they be used to kind of uh, diagnose ourselves, as you touched upon uh, a little bit, uh, Birgit? Uh, so I wonder what your thoughts are about that. So let's go to the whole panel. We can start with, uh, yeah. If I may, I was start uh, there. I mean, as a dream researcher, of course, the, you, I, I assume that dreams um, have all sorts of um, um, gifts that we don't uh, pick up <laughs> along the way. Uh, I know that, um, for instance, authors use their dreams very uh, happily. And they, in, in the sense that they, uh, some, I think Stephen King said that, Caroline, that uh, dreaming is like writing to him. And that sort of this process goes, uh, uh, is interwoven. And um, 
So for, for I also know actors who use streams to um, learn about what they have to play or what their role entails. Because in psychotherapy, we use streams. And uh, I think uh, give, just given the fact that, as I mentioned, uh, keeping it a dream diary seems to um, uh, make us feel better at least uh, is, uh, is, a, is a enough reason to uh, pay more attention to, to one's dreams. But I've also heard people say, of course, uh, uh, I dream so much. I, uh, uh, I I'm not. I'm never well rested. Please make my dreams go away. So this exists as well, but I think not that often. Uh, very briefly, I think dreams can be used for consciousness research. I think they are really interesting uh, <laughs> experiments in a way that natural experiments. Yeah. Well, they keep us in a job in that respect, don't they? So they're really handy. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, I mean, there are there are really pleasurable dream experiences, and and um, you know, people that I have encouraged to keep a dream diary more often than not remark how pleasurable it is. Whether they maintain that for a long time or not, I don't know. But you know, there there is the the potential for enjoyment, even if it's just a kind of self intrigue or what was going through my mind last night. There's some kind of self pleasure from that. I think there's a little bit of caution that we need to bear in mind though, and. Um, and I think if we over encourage people to try and remember dreams when maybe that memory has just gone, we could run the risk of encouraging people to remember something inaccurately. And it's really hard to test the validity of a dream memory. It's virtually impossible. But but by and large, we know from waking memory research that once that memory is gone, we, it's very hard for it to come back entirely. So I think if we want to work with a true, accurate dream memory, we have to be quite careful about the conditions under which people are, are remembering something. Um, if someone suddenly remembers a dream from many years ago, for example, it, it's unlikely it's going to be a, a valid memory. Um, but uh, what we do know is that al although there are a few pleasurable experiences in dreams, so one of those common dream themes was really enjoying a feast or a great meal. I mean, that would be amazing if we could do that and get that pleasure whilst we're asleep and, you know, diet pill company <laughs> be all over it because we don't need to get that pleasure from real food you know we can substitute it that doesn't often happen though even though that's a common dream theme it's it's a very low percentage of overall dreams that might have those kind of pleasurable experiences it's much more common that we wake up before we've achieved that pleasure and that might be some kind of relationship pleasure or sexual pleasure or it might be some kind of experience like flying or jumping or whatever that pleasure might be and much more commonly we wake up before we've just succeeded and that's that can be really um intensely frustrating but we think it increases that motivational drive to go out and then achieve whatever it was that we were aiming for um so it seems that actually dream experiences are, are less pleasurable and a bit more frustrating but perhaps there is function to that Thank you. That was, uh, I think that's uh, great answers. So uh, I think we will finish up with a final question. Uh, and I think this is an interesting question and maybe something for people to uh, take into their their night or into their uh, um, following days. And it's, uh, it's on the topic of lucid dreaming, but also perhaps also on controlling dreams. Uh, they might be related. So there are actually two questions, uh, but I will kind of combine them a little bit. So one is a bit about lucid uh, dreaming and uh, one here in the chat is a uh, frequent lucid dreamer and wonders why people do not realize that they dream or do not realize that they might have control. And the, the other kind of related question to that is, is there ways that we could maybe control our dreams more or uh, control the decontextualization um, in our dreams in a way? Uh, can, can we learn that or is it fully automatic? And, uh, and yeah, so kind of how can, why can't people lucid dream more and how can we, or why can't we, if we can't control our dreams more? kind of two related questions and maybe there is a neuroscientific explanation for for this maybe johan has some ideas but uh, i would like to hear from all of you what what you think so we can maybe start with uh with Birgit. uh 
on on why why can't people lucid dream more? Um, thank you for that wonderful question. And I, uh, that goes back to when we tried to ask Eric about uh, what lucid dreaming does to his model. And he said, not many people have lucid dreams. I kind of had to smile a little bit because, uh, yeah, that is true to one extent. And we just, I can man um, allow me to mention that we just uh, finished a, uh, a survey uh, that includes, I think, 10 countries and uh, about uh, the pandemic, but we also included lucid dreams. And so we will uh, soon have a number of how many people have lucid dreams or they think that they have lucid dreams. I mean, subjectively at least. And that will be very exciting. Up until now, it's the estimate is about 25% uh, of the population. So I think that's not that few. And Again, I'm not a very, not only very enthusiastic dream researcher, I'm also a very enthusiastic lucid dream researcher. And I know that uh, people, if you tell a child uh, about a lucid dream in, in the right words, very often the child will have a, a lucid dream in the next night or the next few nights. So um, I'm raising that question, have we the potential of a, of a lucid dream all the time? I just, we have not... Uh, noticed yet as is a question and this goes back to uh if the, um I, I can't see who uh, yeah Lee, La, lynn i think and she asking why is why is not everybody having lucid dreams so and who, who knows what happens to us when everybody has lucid dreams uh carolyn do you have any thoughts on uh either lucid yeah. dreams or controlling our decontextualization process or otherwise? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, people get really excited about dreams, but people get really excited about lucid dreams. And I think at the risk of sounding a bit cynical, I think people get disproportionately excited about lucid dreams. Yes, most people will experience at least one lucid dream in their lifetime, but it's not a common occurrence for many people. There are individual differences. Some people can do it a lot. And we think the individual differences lie in the way that we wake up. So most lucid experiences occur when we're waking up and it's actually a little glitch when uh, you know we have a little bit more cortical arousal before there's kind of physical arousal because we haven't yet fully uh, awoken. So to me, it, it's not a natural experience. And when people try to learn lucid induction techniques, they're actually interfering with their sleep because they're actually trying to elevate their conscious awareness to a point where they're, they're more awake than asleep. And so fundamentally, as a, a sleep researcher, as well as a dream researcher, I, I feel a little bit worried about that. I, I feel that we know that there is a wealth of information that shows the benefits that we can get from being asleep. And I think it's it's more important that we allow our, our bodies and our physical systems and our mental systems time to be in that sleep state. And I think that would be much more advantageous than trying to learn to control our dreams. It takes a lot of effort and, and it might be causing a little bit more, more damage. If you experience lucid um, experiences, don't worry if it happens naturally, it's okay. Um, just make sure that you're getting good quality sleep as well as that. Yeah. Johan? You have your phone, microphone muted again. Uh, sorry, yeah. So I, I just, I don't, um, I'm not really done research on lucid dreaming, but I have the impression from others who try to do it that it's quite rare, as also Eric said. And uh, so, and it's, it requires a lot of practice to, uh, it depends. Some are talents, but I mean, for most people, it's, it's very, quite difficult. So I was a bit surprised that it's as much as 25%. But um, anyway. Uh, I'd be interested if you could send me the reference for that, but uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. This was very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you mentioned just uh, briefly, uh, Caroline, that uh, it seems or might seem to happen most likely when we are kind of in between wakefulness and sleep at the end of night uh, or in early morning. So, uh, and uh, Birgit, you mentioned uh, lucid dreaming as a therapeutic technique for nightmare disorders. So, is it more likely then to have a lucid dream in a nightmare because then you are more aroused generally because of the strong, uh, fearful emotions that you experience? Or is that, uh, is it, do lucid dreamers kind of trigger their dream in all kinds of states? Or is it more likely to happen in the more 
aroused states of nightmares or uh, uh, I don't know sexual dreams or uh, high balance dream. Hmm. Also, uh, what we know from the nightmare research that we have conducted is that nightmare sufferers, and now they would uh, be qualify for people with nightmare disorder, uh, remember their dreams much more uh, than others. So the, you could claim that they already are more aroused than other people, or at least um, uh, in in touch with their dreams more than other people. Um, there is a connection with the arousal between, uh, the, the, sometimes people describe this, I know this also from my own experience, when you have a nightmare uh, and you, you experience the emotional arousal, you can, uh, when you notice that you're dreaming, switch that and it can become a very, intense feeling of happiness, also the fear, for instance. So that would speak to your theory about, uh, or the, the, the idea that um, also lucid dreaming needs arousal. But I would say it's not mere wakefulness. I think that is a mistake to, to, say, to claim that. There is a study that claimed that it, it, it does introduce, the state is such that you introduce um, capacities that you usually have in waking, but um, you are still in REM sleep. And I like to call it therefore paradoxical dreaming because uh, it can be perceived as even a deeper uh, dream state, so to say. So um, we could discuss, I think one could discuss if lucid dreaming is something, is, is it should be um, defined as another a sleep state, a dream state or sleep state per se, actually. And I think what lucid dreaming also provides is a tool uh, and lots of approaches for uh, getting to know more about how our sleeping brain at least works. One reason is that, uh, for instance, um, now that people uh, learn more lucid dreams, I often also hear them say that they then experience also sleep paralysis. You know, a sleep paralysis is one nightmare, uh, one uh, sleep disorder, uh, and um, of course that would be interesting. Where's the connection there, and 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 why? But then, of course, we have arousal throughout uh, sleeping and. Uh, uh, maybe from some uh, from an arousal, you then enter into the sleep state. We know about the REM sleep and the lucid dreaming, and then um, you add those capacities of wakefulness with the with the arousal, probably. And it would be interesting to see what uh, the uh, what uh, Johan has to say to that, to that acetyl. Colleen, and is it then the adrenaline, maybe, or the, uh, something else that is being added and usually not there? Yeah, I am um, not sure about that. <laughs> so uh, I'll, maybe we can come back to that. I'm uh, quite interested in, um, if you could please set, again send me this reference about the lucid dreaming, that would be very interesting for, for the, the high percentage. And I. Oh, sure. Yeah, and if some of that and these are, uh, some of them say that they're frequent lucid dreamers, that would be interesting to get in contact with them. We could maybe have a, yeah, uh, have a joint st study. Johan, let's plan for that. Absolutely. And, and we're we starting a, a small project about, again, um, um, trying to find out if lucid dreamers are different from other people, uh, but we will have a group of lucid dreamers sometime soon. Yeah. That's that would be nice. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, uh, I say that we can take this, this conversation, we can continue in uh, on uh, over email or in a separate uh, Zoom. As, uh, uh, as uh, someone in the chat uh, so poignantly said, uh, it's time for bed. Uh, <laughs> To practice so, dreaming. Yeah, so we can now all practice dreaming and see uh, how it fits with what we learned today. So uh, I would wish to thank all the panelists uh, so much for joining uh, tonight and uh, for your patience, even though we went over time. 
And uh, I would uh, say that uh, similar to what people in the chat have said, it's been really interesting and it's been great to have a great mix of uh, viewpoints and backgrounds in the panel. Uh, so um, that's kind of uh, <laughs> my finishing remarks. I didn't have anything more prepared. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for coming and thank you, Andre, for the invitation. It's, yeah. uh, it's been really enjoyable. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank and you. Th thank you for inviting us and thank you for organizing a wonderful dream event. It's been very inspiring. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So I wish you all a good night. And uh, I also already spoiled my uh, goodbye, uh, sweet dreams. And thank you, Andrea, as well, of course. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye.